Welcome to Vienna for our 17th winter We are delighted to have with us today a former member of our assembly and now representative of the Italian Chairmanship, Deputy Prime Minister, Deputy or Foreign Minister, it might be Deputy Prime Minister soon, Mr. Vincenzo Amendola, uh, who is now carrying out a very important job and does it for the Italian Chairmanship and the Italian Foreign Minister. You're trying to take those questions. And uh, out. address and out here. Yep. Yep. Of the also with us today is the beautiful Prime Ambassador Thomas Graham, General of also with our memory the first time And then following the remarks, you will be able to ask questions to the speakers. And we have to sign. For this is the to have the opportunity to Mr. Bombardi and a special representative 
on gender issues in the front. And I'm sure that their reports will provide reliable debates in our closing session. Dear friends, it is no secret that the level of dialogue and trust with the OECD is at a historical point. On the other hand, this could be an unfair of multilateral organizations such as the OEC for falling short of doing what is needed to build trust and manage the challenge we face. But on the other hand, we can also be seen as a historical opportunity to revive this organization. After all, let us remember that this organization was founded in Cold War climates and tensions and mistrust. It wasn't, if it wasn't those tensions and the common desire of our government to reduce the threat of war, the organization probably would not exist at all. With the OSC folding spirit, cooperation and threat reduction in mind, we can look at the critical and complex challenges that we face today as potential areas for partnership and cooperation. While some of today's issues are different than ones that the founders of the OSC were concerned about, some of them are remarkably similar. And uh, what is very much the same is the relevance of the OSC's primary model of comprehensive security. We know from experience how the OSC three dimensions of security, the political, military, the economic, environmental, and the human dimensions relate closely to each other. We know that each of these dimensions affect the others and that real security is not possible unless the commitments we have made are fully upheld. We are gathered here in Vienna to share our ideas and to promote problem solving on some of today's most critical issues. Through open dialogue, and I hope that we are able to find the areas where our national interests converge. This should be, this should not be difficult, as there are many such areas, several of which included in the topic of our inter-meeting agenda, and we will tackle challenges such as migration and terrorism, two areas in which there are clear opportunities to join actions to enhance security for all across the U.S. region. We will also hold a debate on the importance of upholding democratic principles in the era of fake news, which should be a concern to all and to all us as a parliamentarians. Arms control and disarmament are also on the agenda. There is an issue that has taken a new relevance and urgency in recent years with the proliferation of weapons, of mass destruction, and the troubling trend about nuclear powers. To try to make the nuclear weapons more usable and remove the signal and the stigma that has long time been attached to a nuclear first strike. We'll also be discussing long-term strategies to tackle climate change and the global consequences, which is obviously a very timely and urgent concern. It is troubling that even while the effects of climate change are incoming and becoming more evident, and the long-term predictions of scientists are proving accurate, we will still have some within the U.S. and countries that fall to take uh, the threat seriously. Dear colleagues, as you may know, I was recently in Ukraine when I had a range of high-level meetings with government and parliament, parliamentary and governmental leaders. I also met representatives from the international community, including the U.N. and OSCSNN. Chief Monitor Ambassador Rapatan of this team. I want to reiterate and to say again what I said here, that the sustained ceasefire is urgently needed and the efforts must be stacked 
act to create a safe environment for the people that know us. The human cost of this conflict is simply unbearable. The OCPA has adopted several resolutions since 2014, expressing our full respect to the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine with its internationally recognized borders, which includes the Crimean Peninsula. But to move forward, we need the full implementation of the Minsk agreements, which set out concrete actions to be undertaken by the sides. Resolving the crisis in and around Ukraine is there something that we in the international community should be able to do. And I remind everyone that we have a blueprint for this process in the form of Minsk agreements. What we need is implementation of these agreements, as well as our OSCPA resolutions. And this will remain a priority of mine as president. And on this topic, we had a very interesting discussion earlier today at the standing committee. We come together at a critical time for the OSC and for the one billion people that we represent. It is not alarmist to say that we are at a crisis point that could lead to a conflagration that we have not seen since 1945. After all, even the conservative Economist magazine ran a cover story in a recent issue warning of the next war and the growing threat of great power conflict. I will stop providing this addition so you can see that. As parliamentarians are policymakers, as policymakers, diplomats and conflict mediators. And it's up to us to make sure that the, this does not come to pass. We should always remember the lessons of history and always guard against the complacency and a false sense of security that in past have led nations to war. In this respect, we should keep in mind that this is Precisely why the OSC exists. It provides a forum for dialogue, for promote security and cooperation, to ensure that our differences are resolved with words rather than with arms. We heard last week at the Munich Security Conference several positive references to the Helsinki process as a best case template for troubled regions around the world. We must be proud of our efforts. We must treasure and nurture our commitments and principles. If we want to shape a secure and stable future for the generations to come, we have no real options except to abide by these commitments. All participating states share this responsibility equally. The crisis in and around Ukraine and of course before the conflict in Georgia is a stark reminder of the dramatic consequences we otherwise had to face. Yeah. Our challenges are many in this area, but each, of, each one of these challenges also represents an opportunity to enhance the level of dialogue and the cooperation. It is in that spirit that I hope we can hold productive debates over the next two days. Thank you all, dear colleagues, for your support. I look forward to working with you all and hope that I can continue to uphold the high level of leadership that was provided by my predecessor, President Mugun. Now I'd like to give floor to our Secretary of State, Amandola. Thank you all. I wish you much success over the next two days. Thank you. Thomas Kremlinger, Ambassador, Member of the Parliament, 
I would like first of all to remark my honor to be here that I consider my family while I was member of the Parliamentary Assembly from 2013-2015. E sono davvero lieto di intervenire portando un messaggio, un messaggio della Presidenza italiana in uno dei momenti più delicati della storia geopolitica del nostro continente e se allarghiamo lo sguardo della nostra assemblea multilaterale che va oltre noi, va oltre i principi che dal 75 uniscono questa assemblea e che guarda ai propri confini, fuori dai propri confini con preoccupazione in una fase che è assolutamente delicata delle relazioni internazionali. Vorrei ringraziare anche tutti voi, membri dei Parlamenti, perché la diplomazia parlamentare è fondamentale per rendere il ruolo dei governi più forte e per rendere quella che è una riflessione culturale, politica e intellettuale all'altezza di quelli che sono i nostri bisogni e per questo vorrei rivolgere un particolare ringraziamento all'amico segretario generale Roberto Montella per il suo apporto nel rendere sempre più efficiente il lavoro di questa nostra assemblea come presidenza italiana abbiamo segnato in queste tre parole dialogo, ownership, responsabilità non soltanto parole chiave del motto ma per riprendere lo spirito di Elsie e riprenderlo oggi in questo scenario turbolento delle relazioni geopolitiche. Oggi l'OSCE la dobbiamo difendere, preservare, dobbiamo capire qual è il suo valore e prendercene cura. E per questo vorrei ringraziare gli ambasciatori, l'ambasciatore italiano a zona e tutti gli ambasciatori, perché dopo cinque mesi di intensi negoziati il bilancio unificato dell'OSCE per il 2018 è stato approvato sotto la presidenza italiana, un risultato significativo che permetterà alla nostra organizzazione di operare efficacemente per fronteggiare le sfide che abbiamo di fronte. Ma quali sono le nostre sfide? Il Presidente già le indicato e sarà per voi, per il Segretario Generale, un compito straordinario, di novità, perché noi sappiamo che quello che gli uomini fanno e creano è anche un pensiero nuovo per uscire dai conflitti. Le nostre sfide innanzitutto è trovare una soluzione alle crisi e intorno all'Ucraina rimane la principale sfida che costituisce anche il mandato dell'OSCE. Non a caso la prima missione del ministro degli esteri italiano a Fano è stata proprio a Kiev, a Mosca e nel Donbass per incoraggiare una ripresa costruttiva del negoziato e la piena attuazione degli accordi di Minsk. Ha visitato la missione speciale del monitoraggio in Ucraina per ribadire il nostro sostegno al ruolo fondamentale che sta svolgendo e impedire una nuova e pericolosa escalation della crisi. Dobbiamo lavorare per garantire la sicurezza degli osservatori, innanzitutto a cui va il nostro saluto e il nostro sostegno e per assicurare alla missione le condizioni necessarie a svolgere un lavoro efficace. È importante intensificare gli sforzi negoziali, essere convinti degli sforzi negoziali nel quadro del formato Normandia del gruppo trilaterale di contatto perché noi sappiamo che il futuro del Donbass nel quadro di una Ucraina territorialmente integra, indipendente e sovrana deve essere raggiunto con un grande sforzo negoziale è fondamentale che gli attori interessati diano prova di genuina volontà di compromesso noi sappiamo, e lo diceva uno dei fondatori del processo di Helsinki, il cardinale Cassaroli che il timore del peggio deve spingere i responsabili delle sorti dei popoli a cercare i modi per evitare la catastrofe e questa preoccupazione è alla base della politica di estensione che fa sì che il nostro lavoro e quello della carta di Helsinki oggi sia centrale e la ricerca continua di un approccio distensivo e di compromesso oggi più che mai essenziale e non si possono tollerare ritardi o altri 
Confermiamo come Presidenza italiana, siamo al lavoro, il nostro impegno sui principali conflitti protratti. Quanto alla Transnistria, la dinamica incoraggiante di fine anno si è confermata in questo primo scorcio di Presidenza italiana. Il nostro rappresentante speciale Frattini è in contatto con le parti e con i principali attori a livello internazionale, in particolar modo con le sue controparti nel formato 5 più 2. Si recherà nelle prossime settimane in visita sul posto per sforzi, sostenere questi sforzi affinché le parti colgano anche qui un'opportunità, una novità storica che hanno davanti a sé. Sulla Georgia sosteniamo le discussioni internazionali di Ginevra e appoggiamo pienamente l'operato del rappresentante speciale, l'ambasciatore Beckler, che ringraziamo per l'impegno straordinario. Riteniamo necessario esplorare ogni possibile occasione di dialogo informale attraverso le linee di demarcazione. Incoraggiamo anche qui le parti a lavorare insieme con pragmatismo per affrontare sfide come quelle ambientali che toccano tutte le popolazioni dell'area. Sul Nagorno Karabakh appoggiamo l'attività dei co-presidenti del gruppo di Minsk per una soluzione definitiva e condivisa del conflitto. I recenti sviluppi sia relativi ai nuovi incontri dei co-presidenti con i presidenti Aliyev e Sarsian e l'intesa raggiunta a fine gennaio sull'ampliamento della missione di monitoraggio guidata anche qui da un valido ambasciatore, l'ambasciatore Caspi, testimoniano evoluzioni positive che sta a noi coltivare e rafforzare. Cari colleghi, noi sappiamo che l'OSCE oggi è centrale perché sui temi dei confini e delle connessioni tra continenti noi ricostruiamo una mappa della convivenza geopolitica non solo per il nostro continente, per l'Europa, ma per quelli che sono continenti che si affacciano come priorità dell'agenda di questo secolo. Per questo noi daremo molto rilievo e priorità al Mediterraneo, al MENA, al suo bacino di sfide e opportunità, perché sappiamo che affrontare sfide della sicurezza e favorire maggiori prosperità è fondamentale per l'OSCE e i suoi stati partecipanti, ma su confini e connessioni il rapporto che tra Europa, Africa e Asia sarà decisivo per comprendere anche qual è la nostra idea di sicurezza, di convivenza pacifica e dei valori di esso. Noi lo sappiamo che il Mediterraneo oggi è l'hub non solo di un rapporto tra le due sponde, ma è l'hub di un rapporto tra Europa e Africa, che sarà la partnership decisiva per la sicurezza mondiale del XXI secolo, ma soprattutto per lo sviluppo, per la capacità di intere popolazioni di sollevarsi dalla povertà e costruire uno sviluppo sostenibile per i loro paesi. Noi sappiamo che oggi confini e connessioni sono in discussione, e spesso esaltare i confini contro le connessioni significa dare spinte che creano tensioni e l'equilibrio che si troverà tra confini e connessioni e i principi dei valori di Helsinki determinano una nuova agenda di politica internazionale. Per questo è il Mediterraneo, non per la specificità geografica dell'Italia, ma per la visione e l'orizzonte del nostro continente verso il XXI secolo e le sue sfide, le connessioni con l'Africa, con l'Asia e come ai confini di queste connessioni costruiamo pace e cooperazione. Per questo abbiamo convocato una conferenza mediterranea di Palermo e ringraziamo molto l'Assemblea che ha creato anche un comitato ad hoc sulle migrazioni, perché oggi le migrazioni sono parte di questa sfida, non sono un'emergenza sono il rapporto strutturale che ci sarà tra i continenti e come noi sulle migrazioni costruiamo cooperazione avremo più pace, più benessere e anche risoluzione di conflitti. Lo squilibrio demografico tra Europa e Africa è evidente, lo squilibrio tra quelli che sono i, i grandi progetti di un continente che si è messo in cammino e quelle che sono le necessità di noi europei. Vi faccio un piccolo esempio, la Libia. La Libia oggi è una sfida nella ricostruzione di un dialogo politico e questo è il tipico dell'OSCE. 
costruzione di convivenza pacifica e questo è tipico dei nostri valori è un paese attraversato da migrazioni non libiche ma tra l'Africa e l'Europa che noi dobbiamo saper gestire ed è un paese in cui i nostri valori oggi richiedono una forza di intervento non solo come europei ma in base a quelli che sono i valori fondanti dell'OSCE gestire le immigrazioni oggi significa parlare di integrazione e per questo ringrazio l'alto commissario per le minoranze nazionali Lamberto Zanier che deve legare il grande fenomeno a cui noi siamo interessati e cui il comitato ad hoc dell'assemblea dedicherà il lavoro con lo sforzo di parlare alle nostre società di integrazione e di accoglienza l'OSCE offre un modello di dialogo basato su principi che in prospettiva, come sempre suggerisce il Presidente del Consiglio Gentiloni, possiamo immaginare come un paradigma per il Mediterraneo allargato e per il Medio Oriente. Possiamo parlare di un Helsinki del Mediterraneo, possiamo parlare cioè di uno strumento che mettiamo a disposizione sulla base della nostra storia per quei popoli che cercano di ricostruire dialogo politico. Oggi noi lo sappiamo guardando il massacro umanitario in Siria che la cosa principale per fermare le guerre non è solo la soluzione ma è costruire le condizioni perché i popoli si seggano al tavolo e fermino massacri contro innocenti e contro bambini. Noi sappiamo che l'Helsinki del Mediterraneo è uno strumento e più saremo forti noi nel risolvere i confini ai nostri confini, ai nostri conflitti più daremo un esempio e daremo forza a quello che è lo sforzo per completare un sogno di pace e di cooperazione al di fuori dei nostri confini oggi il Mediterraneo è l'1% della carta geografica mondiale ma connette tre continenti l'Asia, l'Africa, l'Europa e la grande sfida per le nostre tre dimensioni e far sì che per i nostri valori costruiamo anche pace al di fuori. Sappiamo benissimo, caro Presidente, utilizzando le nostre tre dimensioni, quella politico-militare, quella economica-ambientale, quella umana, della dimensione umana, che oggi riscrivere una carta dell'impianto multilaterale è molto complicato. I grandi soggetti e le grandi istituzioni multilaterali hanno bisogno non solo di documenti e di lavoro ma anche di azioni concrete su questo la Presidenza insieme a voi all'Assemblea parlamentare e ai parlamentari scriveremo una mappa per rendere attuale e per rendere sicura quella che è la carta dell'OSCE sulle tre dimensioni e su uno sforzo che faremo insieme come Presidenza italiana Cercheremo ovviamente di lottare perché anche le forme nuove di discriminazione, di razzismo, di xenofobia, di intolleranza che si stanno affacciando di nuovo nelle società europee vengano sconfitte. L'abbiamo fatto organizzando una conferenza internazionale sulla lotta all'antisemitismo a Roma il 29 gennaio e continueremo per combattere ogni tipo di intolleranza e di discriminazione religiosa, culturale, politica di ogni genere. E nei nostri valori e nel nostro mandato, se mi permettete, l'attualità e la forza dell'OSCE. Dear President, dear Secretary General, dear colleagues, I remember in the last in my two years of time where we were spending in discussion and voting resolution in this assembly, that many times the finding a wording is decisive to, to finding a balance among us. But we know that nowadays, at the level of Member of Parliament, at the level of government, we have to push forward the balance. Sometimes the equilibrium among the position is not enough. Sometimes Europe is forgetting that in front of us, looking at our border, other continents, other tragedies, other opportunities are moving faster. And so what we can teach to ourselves, what we can teach to the global community as OSHA is that our basic value coming from LCP 75 
and useful nowadays to rewrite the multilateral balance. It's part of political dimension, but it's also a part of a human dimension, not to be satisfied by the balance, but to push forward. Because now it's time for us as Europeans, but also for our constituency as OSCE, give a sense to the political compromise, finding conclusion, finding out some solution for our global community. Thank you very much, and I hope to cooperate alongside all the Italian presidents with all the good input that will come from the assembly. Thank you. Grazie mille, dear, dear Vincenzo. Uh, I think it was really very insightful and comprehensive uh, speech. Emotional as Italians should do, and which is, uh, which is uh, of course, important. And I'd like once again to say that uh, we had a three hours discussion in our standing committee before we start the session, and we've been focused mostly on issues that you said, and especially you know, the spirit of Helsinki, first of all, and then the results that we do. You're absolutely right that balance is not enough at this time. And uh, we will, I think, have a very good cooperation with the Italian chairmanship. Once again, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Anzoni. And uh, we had a very good meeting with this in our half fun. And we felt it everywhere where we've been in the last three months. Strong help of the Italian chairmanship in our endeavors. And I think it will be exceptional cooperation with the OIC Parliament. Uh, now, Dear colleagues and friends, I'd like to ask to the floor uh, Secretary General of the C Ambassador Thomas Greninger, and uh, I also like to say from the outset that we established in a short time very good, very fruitful cooperation, and it's also very promising collaboration with our permanent council. And again, th thank you, Thomas, for this this closure. Mr. Chairperson, dear George, I'm the Secretary of State, Amendola, Excellencies, uh, dear colleagues, thank you for inviting me to address this distinguished meeting. I appreciate any chance to speak uh, with the Parliamentary Assembly. This time I attach special importance to our interaction because I would like to use this opportunity to share with you some of my views on making the OEC fit for purpose. Last week, I presented a non-paper to participating states on some suggestions of reform. My motivation is to strengthen the OEC, adapt it to changing times, and to make it more responsive to the needs of participating states. You may ask, why now? First, the political climate. The OEC is needed more than ever to help states cope with the challenges of change and foster cooperation at a time of deep distrust and dangerous unpredictability. Second, the financial situation. Times are tough, resources are tight. We need to ensure maximum effectiveness. And third, structural conditions. The OEC has evolved in an organic way over the past 25 years. Its ability to adapt has been one of its strengths. But it has never fully made the transition from a conference to an organization. Nor has there been a sober assessment of its fitness for carrying out the tasks it has been mandated to do. Therefore, I have identified three priority areas for reform. I call them the three keys. Using the OEC as a platform for, supportive, for supporting inclusive dialogue and joint action, working towards a positive unifying agenda, and leveraging partnerships. Allow me to explain each of these three in a bit more depth. 
First, the overriding priority is to support inclusive dialogue and joint action. This is uh, the first key. I stress support because dialogue and action are up to participating states. But I see a role in the Secretariat in supporting these processes as effectively as possible. The structured dialogue is a case in point. It is also about using the security days. This is the Secretary General's informal dialogue platform uh, in a more uh, systematic uh, and effective uh, way. And I would also like to make to create more uh, informal spaces for dialogue to generate and to test ideas. And I have established a, a strategic policy support unit to enhance our ability to provide support to challenges and to conceptualize and plan more strategically. The main output of, of inclusive dialogue should be a positive unifying agenda. That is the second key. Uh, that an agenda that enhances security and cooperation in the OEC area. Again, I would see the structured dialogue as a key process for developing that agenda. But there may be other ways to strengthen the sense of common purpose and get us pulling more in the same direction. Ladies and gentlemen, we are an organization of relatively modest means, but significant capabilities. I therefore attach great importance to leveraging partnerships. And this is my third key. What do I mean by that? There is scope to strengthen the OEC's role and profile as a regional arrangement of the United Nations under Chapter 8 of the UN Charter. We should revitalize the platform for cooperative security. We should enhance partnerships with relevant regional and other intergovernmental organizations, including through implementation of practical activities. And we should explore the possibility of opening license offices to raise our profile and connect more closely to other multilateral processes. I would also like us to reach out to new partners. For, the, for example, development actors, international financial institutions, aid agencies, and the private sector. And I would want to adopt a more strategic and mutually beneficial approach to our Mediterranean and to our Asian partnerships for cooperation. And I definitely see a greater scope for working with you, the parliamentary assembly. And let me say, before uh, I go any further, how pleased I am about the state of cooperation between the governmental structures of the OEC and the PA today. A truly cooperative spirit has set in. Nothing to be compared with the conflictual relation I had experienced when I was still a Swiss OEC ambassador a few years ago. And I would like to thank you all for this. In particular, gratitude goes to, the, to President uh, Terretelli and to Secretary General uh, Roberto Montella uh, for this. And I'm convinced that we need this good cooperation to be capable uh, of facing the challenges of the future. We need to increase awareness of the OEC in legislative bodies in participating states, to generate political will, to secure sufficient financial resources, and to ensure implementation of commitments. And I believe you, parliamentarians, have also a key role to play in rebuilding trust. Trust in politicians and institutions. Trust between states. And trust in the ability of countries to work together, including through the OEC, to address complex threats and challenges that defy borders. So, that is the, the purpose of reform. Now, what about the fitness of the organization? I have identified seven possible areas of reform 
Some of which fall under my responsibility as Secretary General uh, Songs and uh, Now. After six months uh, in my job, I see the need for the Secretariat to be more responsive, more responsive to the priorities of participating states. As a first step, we need to better understand the challenges resulting from the organization's organic growth over the past few decades. So I have asked the Office of Internal Oversight to carry out a managed review of the Secretariat to provide me with evidence-based analysis and options to align resources more closely to participating states' priority activities. The review should also generate recommendations on how to increase the effectiveness, the agility, and the flexibility of the Secretariat, and suggest measures to realize efficiency gains and more potential savings. Second, delivering in the field. Ladies and gentlemen, one of our greatest assets is our field activity. To maintain the OEC's comparative advantage of delivering in the field, I propose to discuss how to maximize impact on the ground through existing field operations, how to ensure effective cooperation with host authorities and the sense of ownership, while retaining a necessary degree of freedom of action for our field presences, and how the OEC can deliver on the ground in the future through new and flexible approaches, including in participating states where there is currently no established field presence, and this both east and west of Vienna. This, by the way, will be a, a topic of focus um, at the next security day extra ground table on the 27th of April. Third, I think I don't need to convince you that the current budget process is far from ideal and requires reform. For some time, the Parliamentary Assembly has been calling for greater accountability and greater transparency. I suggest that the budget should be aligned more closely with the political and operational priorities of participating states and place increased focus on measurable results. I intend to introduce a number of reform proposals that would include the introduction of a multi-year strategic planning process biannual budgeting and a more methodological approach across the organization for reprioritization and ensuring efficiencies. Suggestions will also be made to strengthen the extra budgetary funding mechanism to harmonize it more closely with strategic objectives and to more effectively leverage partnerships. Our staff is our greatest resource. So the fourth part of my fitness plan is to ensure that we continue to attract and to retain the best people. To this end, three areas will be the priority for reform of human resources. First, I will push hard for gender parity. Second, enhancements of the secondment system will be proposed. And third, further steps will be taken to explore possibilities to modernize the OEC contract policy, preserving the non-career nature of the OEC while drawing lessons from past practices in similar non-career international organizations. Fifth, I believe that further steps are needed to bring gender and to bring youth into the mainstream of our world. Not only will I aim for gender equality, we will promote the implementation of Human Security Council Resolution 1325 and the 2004 OEC Gender Action Plan. Youth issues and perspectives will also be given greater attention and inclusion. The sixth point concerns technology. Information technology should be a force for innovation and positive change within the organization. I think there is a great untapped potential. The reform process will propose an upgrade of the existing ICT infrastructure and its service delivery approach. 
A review will also be carried out to see how technology can increase productivity and efficiencies, ensure adequate ICT and information security, and enhance ICT governance and standardization across OECD's decentralized system. Lessons will also be drawn from the OECD's use of technology in this country. Finally, I think we need to promote ourselves better. Our organization does not receive the attention it deserves for its contribution to preventing conflict and strengthening stability and security. So as part of the reform process, we should focus more on sharpening and raising OEC's profile. To show why the OEC matters, to tell our story better, and to reach a wider audience. And this is an area where you, members of the Parliamentary Assembly, can help. I urge you to include specific references to the OEC in your government work plans, to hold hearings on OEC-related issues, and to generate support for the organization work. Ladies and gentlemen, from experience, I know that the reform process can only be successful if they are consultative and collaborative. We have ideas, but not all the answers. So I count on the engagement and support of participating states, the executive structures, OEC staff, and the parliamentary assembly. Indeed, I hope the very process of discussing reform can help break down some silos within the organization and stimulate greater collaboration and a more strategic and a more multi-year approach. I realize that some of the issues that I have raised are not in my hands. Some of the proposed steps will have to be taken by participating states. A few are my priority. Still others will require a combined approach. For example, reforms proposed by me that would require the approval of, approval of participating states or initiatives proposed by chairmanships of participating states that would be implemented with the support of executive structures. This can only work if it is a true joint venture. The process will take time and sequencing will be important. There may be some quick wins that can be implemented relatively soon. Some changes can be introduced in the budget proposal for 2019. Other reforms may take several years. What is vital is to start the process. Colleagues, the OEC Parliamentary Assembly has always been in the vanguard of reform. I therefore look to you as a key ally in making the organization fit for purpose. I hope that I can count on your support. I look forward to working with you and thank you so much for your attention. Secretary General, to your Thomas, I think you appreciate your remarks, uh, your willingness to work closely with the Parliamentary Assembly. I wanted to share with the Standing Committee today that we had a very good exchange with the Permanent Council and we offered our support. And that's very natural that we are doing because we have to join our efforts. But of course, we also welcome to see that. The governmental side is also ready to work actively and be engaged with the parliamentary counterparts. And as you said, we are also drivers of reforms. We have many ideas in this world. Parliamentarians are very capable people, so we are also anticipating the governmental part will pick up important things and help us to implement those ideas and reforms. Our internal and also for the whole. To see as a one important, very important organization in this volatile and challenging time. Thank you very much again. And uh, before I will open questions and answer sessions with colleagues, I will proceed with this. We have uh, two guests as a tradition for the winter meeting and some other meetings. We have guest speakers. Um, and I would like to invite President of the Parliament of Montenegro, Mr. Ivan Krajovic, to deliver a short address. And then we have another guest that will also be 
address and I'd uh, like to ask our guests to be uh, most official. Gospodine predsjedniče, poštovane nam i gospodo, dragi kolegice i kolege, dozvolite da vas pozdravim u ime delegacije Skupštine Srne Gori u svoje ličnje ime. Osobno mi je zadovoljstvo da učestvujem na sastancima parlamentarne Skupštine, imajući u vidu da predstavljaju jedinstvenu platformu za dialog i konstruktivnu razmjenu mišljenja o suštinskim važnim pitanjima za region Ajusa. Izazovi prijetnje današnjice, namiču nam potrebu da se posjetimo na ključnu premisu u temeljnim osnimačkim i praktičnim dokumentima naše organizacije, na koje smo se zajedno obovezali, a to su bezbjednost i demokratija, gdje su oni medisobno povezani i usvojeni procesi. Trajna bezbjednost i stabilnost podrazumijaju poštovanje ljudskih prava i osnovnih sloboda, posvećenost demokratskim vrijednostima i vladevnih prava. Sa žaljenje možemo konstatovati da su mnogi od osnovnih principa Helsinškog tekaloga na kojima se temelji naša organizacija dovedeni u pitanje. Stiče se utisak da smo suočeni s velikom krizom posvećenosti i poštovanja fundamentalnih principa i zajedničkih vrijednosti i obaveza. Mišljenja sam da zajednički moramo da nađemo načina kako da osiguramo njihovo puno poštovanje i dosljedno sprovođenje kako bi našim građanima osigurali sigurniju budućnost. S naše vladevne prava i principa demokratije u zgradnji pravednih društava koje obezbeđuju održivi ekonomski razvoj i rast kao i društvo jednake šansi nije nikad suvišno nagotavati. Poštovane koleginici i kolege, svjesni činjenice da je svaka država snažna onoliko koliko su jake njene institucije, mi u Crnoj Gori od obnove državnosti 2006. godine marljivo radimo na jačanju vladevine prava i snaženju demokratskog kapaciteta naših institucija. Nakon sprovođenja zahtjevnih reformi i ispunjavanja neophodnih kriterijuma, prošle godine postavili smo 29. članica nadzora. Sada sve raspoložive kapacitete društva jer snažnije usmjeravamo po ostvarenju drugog manjskog političkog komuniteta naše zemlje, članstva u Evropskoj uniji. Proces evropske integracije doživljavamo kao najbolji okvir za sprovođenje sveokupnih reformi i dostizanje najviših standarda koji imaju za primarni cilj u napređenje kvaliteta života svakog naše građanina. S otvorenih 30 od ukupno 33 pregovaračka poglavlja, zemlja smo kandidat koja je najbliža članstva. Uskoro se Ukoliko se nastavi dosledno poštovanje principa regata, koji je jedin i pravedan način i pravedan kad je u pitanju politika proširenja i za koji se mi zalažemo, nema sumnje, da će Crna Gora biti prva sljedeća članica EU. Osjetit ću nas korakšnje pokušaje da se Crna Gora zaustavi na svom euroatlanskom i evropskom putu. Suđenje okruženima za pokušaj terorizma na dan parlamentarnih izbora 2016. godine se prenosi na javnom servisu, čime je obezbiđena potpuna transparentnost čitavog procesa. Očekujemo da će u profesionalnom i fersudskom postupku u što skorije broku doći do potpunog razvetljavanja pomenutog događaja. Za sada samo mogu reći da smo uspjeli da i se izborimo sa značajnim bezbjednostnim izazovima i očuvamo političku stabilnost. Dužnost mi je da vas također posjetim na činjenicu da najveći broj opozicijnih poslanika nezadovoljen rezultatima parlamentarnih izbora u prethodnih godini nije učestvo u radu Skupštine i njenih radnih dijela. Međutim, takav odnos na poštovanje državnih institucija nije naišao na odobravanje građana, da se veći broj opozicijnih poslanika vrati u Skupštinu, tako da sada preko dvije trećine poslanika učestvuje u njenom radu. U susred predstavićim predsjedničnim izborima koji će se održati 15. aprila kao i lokalnim izborima u najvećem broju opština tokom 2018. godine, Skupština Crne Gore je formila radnu grupu sa zadatkom da analizira primjenu izborov zakonodavstva i na osnovu konačnog izveštaja posmatračke misije OSCR, ODIRA, 
Od moderanih parlamentarnih izbora 16. oktobera 2016. godine razmotri i predloži način implementacije preporuka iz navedenog izveštaja. Radna grupa je održala konsultativne sastanke sa predstavnicima svih institucija koje su nadležne za implementaciju relevantnog zakonodavstva, ovi sa svim subjektima koji su iskazali interesovanje i prazložili moguće rješenja i prijedloge u pravcu jašanja izbornog zakonodavstva. Najveći dio preporuka je usvojen i postojeće izborne cikuse u Crnoj Gori dočekujemo sa dodatno napređenim izbornim zakonodavstvom. Nisu usvojene samo izmjene zakona o izboru odbornih i poslanika, s obzirom na to da smo se sločili sa absurdnom situacijom. Opozicija koja je izgovor za izbore neuspjeh i izborni ambijent nije pokazala spremnost da doprinese njegovom napređenju. Predstojeće predsjedničke izbore u Crnoj Gori će pratiti posmatrači OSC Odira, kao i posmatrači Parlamentarne skupštine Savjeta Evropa, koji su pozitivno odgovorili na poziv koji sam im putio istog dana kada sam raspisao predsjedničke izbore. Vjerujem da dosljednjim sprovođenjem jasne politike i neoklonih reformi potvrđujemo sposobnost da se kontinuirano nadograđujemo i transformišemo se na ovosko društvo. Duboko sam uvjeren da samo onda, kada svi preuzmemo svoj dio odgovornosti, kada vodimo otvoren iskri dijalog i dražimo zajedničke rješenje za brojne izazove sa kojima se sločavamo, možemo biti sigurni da ćemo u budućim generacijama obezbiriti trajan mir i stabilnost. Hvala vam na pažnju. Also engaged with the with the country and with the region, and we should success uh, coming elections there. Another speaker is the uh, president of the House of Council of the Kingdom of Morocco, Mr. Hakim Benjamin, and uh, we ask him to be the floor. He's also doing good examples of cooperation of PA with the Mediterranean partners. Thank you, Mr. Chesna. Ladies and gentlemen, if you allow, I am going to use the Arabic language, of course the translation to the other official languages will be as well. Thank you for uh, your cooperation. The server of Rosa, see that we set up. Rosa will be carried in the government of the Wapan and the Sharika, the Wapan of America, the Wapan of the Wapan of the Wapan. أود بس الوفد البرلماني القهري أن أتقدم لكم بالشكر الجزيل على دعوتكم الكريمة وعلى إتاحة فرصة لنا للتواصل معكم في أشغال هذه الدورة الشتوية لمنظمة الأمن والتعاون في أوروبا. لا أعتقد أنني بحاجة إلى التفكير بمسار التعاون المثمر بين المغرب ومنظمة الأمن والتعاون في أوروبا. فأنا لا يعني وانحراف المغرب المبكر في مسلسل الحوار والتعاون والأمن منذ مؤتمر هلسنكي سنة 1995. فأنا متأكد أن داخلة وأرشيف منظمة الأمن والتعاون في أوروبا وهيئاتها تسجل وتحتفل برصيد المساهمات الناقصه التي قدمها المغرب طوال اكثر من 40 سنه وفي مختلف اوراش ومجالات واولويات اشتراك المنظمه ولا اعتقد انني بحاجه ايضا الى التفكير بمتانه وقوه القيم والقواسم المشتركه التي تجمعنا فالمغرب كما تعرفون حريص على الانحراف في منظومة القيم الكونية المشتركة، قيم الديمقراطية وحقوق الإنسان كما هي متعارف عليها عالميا، ولذلك لم يكن غريبا أن دستور المملكة المغربية ينص على الالتزام بحقوق الإنسان كما هي متعارف عليها عالميا، وينص على سمو القانون الدولي على القوانين الوطنية، وينص على اعتبار الخيار الديمقراطي التعددي خيار لا رجعة فيه، ولكنني أحرص على التفكير بالتحديات المشتركة، 
وعلى التطلعات والطموحات في المشترك فنحن جميعا في سفينة واحدة وعلينا أن نمضي قدما في التصدي المشترك للتحديات العابرة الحدود المتربصة بها في عالم لا يزال يهيمن عليه الكثير من الطرق ويهيمن عليه الكثير من عدم اليقين إنني هنا أؤكد بأن المرأة يجدد انخراطه والتزامه وهذا خيارنا الذاتي السيادي نحن المغاربه ملكا وشعبا للتعاون معكم والعمل المشترك معكم ففيما يتعلق بمواجهه المخاطر المرتبطه بالتهديدات الامنيه والارهابيه فالمغرب كما تعرفون طور تجربه رائده في مكافحه هذا التهديد العابر الحدود وارجوكم ان تلاحظوا بان المغرب منذ البدايه كان واعيا بعدم السقوط في الفخ الذي يريد الارهابيون ان يجروا اليه فنحن قاومنا وكافحنا التهديدات الارهابيه ولكن في نفس الوقت مضينا قدما في مباشره العمل واطلاق عدد من الاوراش والديناميات الاصلاحيه من اجل بناء دوله الحق والقانون وفيما يتعلق بتحديات المرتبطه بالهجره فالمغرب كما تعرفون لم يعد بلدا مصدرا للهجره لم يعد يعني بلدا يعني بلد عبور للمهاجرين بل اصبح بلد استقبال واستقرار افواج متلاحقه من المهاجرين الهاربين من البؤس ومن النزاعات ومن الحروب ومن الازمات والمغرب يتوفر اليوم على استراتيجيه وطنيه تستجيب بالمعايير الدوليه للقانون الدولي لحقوق الانسان فيما يتعلق بمعالجه مشكل الهجره وهذه الاستراتيجيه يتجلاها ويشرف عليها ملك المغرب شخصيا وانتم تعرفون بان المغرب يستعد لاحتضان المؤتمر العالمي في دجنب 2018 والذي ينتظر ان يتوج باصدار الميثاق العالمي حول الهجره والتنميه وفيما يتعلق ب والتهديدات والتحديات المرتبطه بالتغيرات المناخيه فانتم تعرفون ان المغرب بلدي يمضي بثبات في صياغه واعتماد نموذج راقد فيما يتعلق بالطاقات المتجدده اما فيما يتعلق بالوش بناء الديمقراطيه والاصلاحات الديمقراطيه ونظرا ابراج سيدات السابق لتعدد وتنوع وتوالي المشاريع الاصلاحيه التي لا شر فيها المغرب العمل فقد اعددت وثيقه موجوده هنا موزعه عليكم تقربكم من مسار الاصلاحات الديمقراطيه التي اختارت فيها المغرب منذ سنوات مداخله او وثيقه تشرح لكم هذه الديناميات الاصلاحيه تحت عنوان المغرب مسار اصلاحي متجدد في محيط جهوي متقدم قرارات السيدات والساده الافاضل لدي هنا باسم البرلمان المغربي أربعة أو خمسة رسائل أريد أن أوجهها لكم جميعا. الرسالة الأولى بالرغم من الاضطرابات الموجعة التي تتلقاها داعش اليوم فإن الخطر والتهديدات الإرهابية لا يزال قائما. وأود أن ألفت انتباه منظمة الأمن والتعاون في أوروبا إلى أن هناك في منطقة الساحل جنوب الصحراء نوع من من الزواج او التحالف الموضوعي بين الحركات الارهابيه ومنظمات الجريمه المنظمه والحركات الانفصاليه واننا ندعو منظمه الامن والتعاون في اوروبا الى اعتبار التهديدات الامنيه الاتيه للمنطقه الساحل اولويه قصوى في اجنده وفي برنامج عمل منظمه الامن والتعاون في اوروبا. الرساله الثانيه اننا في المغرب نقدر عاليا المجهودات التي تقوم بها منظمه الامن والتعاون في اوروبا فيما يتعلق بالتصدي للازمات والتوترات وفيما يتعلق بالتصدي للتهديدات العابره للحدود ولكن نود ان نلفت انتباهكم الى ضروره بناء او اعاده بناء استراتيجيه المنظمه في اتجاه معالجه الازمات في اماكن تواجدها فالارهاب يجب ان يعالجه في المناطق التي تنتج التصرف التطرف وتصدر الارهاب والهجره يجب ان يعالجها في المناطق التي تصدر يعني المهاجرين غير النظاميين. والرساله الثالثه 
التي يهمني ان ابرر هذا الحكم وهي المتعلقه بضروره اعاده الاعتبار لمفهوم الامن الشامل كما وضعت في نطاق هيتسيكي ولا بد من ان نرتد في انتباه السيدات والساده المحترمين بان المغرب سعيد لرئاسه ايطاليا ولكنني الاستراتيجيه التي تنظر الى اعاده الاعتبار بالاولويات المرتبطه بالبعد المتوسط واخيرا سيكون المغرب سعيدا وفخورا باستضافتكم فنحن ندعو منظمه امن التعاون في اوروبا الى عقد دورتها المقبله في المغرب من اجل اعطاء الشراكه مع الجنوب ما تستحقه من اهميه فاود ان اقول في الاخير الانتباه الى ان شعوب القاره افريقيا قدمت في الكثير من المناسبات عبرت عن ارادتها وعن جديتها فيما يتعلق بالتصدي ومعالجه التهديدات التي هي مطروحه في اجندتكم ولا بد من النظر الى الجنوب الجنوب المتوسط في اعتباره شريكا في هذه المعركه اشكركم على حسن انتباهكم واشكر السيد رئيس very optimistic remarks and uh, we are happy to cooperate with you closely and of course if it happened that we will continue our we will be gathering in Morocco it's really a very strong signal of very deep and strong cooperation with Mediterranean specifically with Next time. So dear colleagues now we are opening uh, our question and answer session. Unfortunately we have as always very limited time. Uh, we have uh, 14 of our speakers on the list, but I would like to suggest to this so we might do five first questions and just let them let our speakers respond and then go ahead. And also to say that after 1.30 we will continue a little bit without the presentation, we you know that. Uh, so I would like to add, of course, the questions and not Remarks for remarks, we have other, other parts of our So the first question, after one minute, um, Richard Hudson, U.S. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you for your strong leadership. It's also uh, Mr. Nola and Mr. Kremminger for your uh, very, very uh, strong presentations. Uh, I'll also raise the issue of Ukraine. Ukraine is marking the fourth year of a brutal conflict under which the civilians suffer every day. This is a conflict manufactured by the leadership of Russia. The conflict has claimed more than 10,000 lives in Russia, a dire humanitarian situation in the Displacing some 2.5 million people, most of them now living in other parts of Ukraine. Civilians living along the line of contact face constant risk in the almost daily show. Respect for human rights and the rule of law in eastern Ukraine is virtually non existent. Uh, the aggressive and similar behavior against other neighbors has been condemned by this assembly on a number of occasions as a clear, gross, and uncorrected violation of the Helsinki principles by the Russian government. The Russian government continues to fuel the conflict by training, equipping, funding, and fighting alongside the so called separatists. I would also like to take the opportunity to thank the courageous OSCE monitors. I'm very sure it's a little bit noisy for this speech. Thank you. I'd also like to uh, thank the courageous OSCE monitors who serve the eyes and ears of the world in this conflict zone, relying, relaying the tragedy of this conflict every day in an extremely difficult situation. We appreciate the extremely valuable work they do in calling Russia and its proxy to cease hindering the special monitoring mission's ability to do its job. And so I would ask Mr. Mendela, please outline the chairmanship's views on resolving the conflict in Ukraine. And Mr. Greminger, uh, can you update us on how we can best ensure the OSCE monitors in Ukraine are able to do their job safely and effectively? Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sarano. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Gerasimo. No, the evolution of the Russian aggression has made it absolutely clear that its character and scale require an active engagement of the United States and the deployment of a full strength of the United States to make the world be sustainable. The Russian aggression must pull back from the Ukrainian territory Russian troops and mercenaries fighters and weaponry and instead the UN Christians will have to move in for establishment of the necessary security environment for all. Both local civilians and international actors. That means deployment of the UN mission throughout the areas of past now to fight the forces of the Russian Federation, including at the uncontrolled state border between Ukraine and the Russian Federation to make it secure and very quiet. And now flashing for both our speakers. What is your opinion about the UN peacekeeping mission in the past and the particular point of the uncontrolled part of the Thank you, uh, Ms. Nagdalian. I would like to thank the uh, High Representative of the Italian Chairmanship of the Secretary of the and the Secretary of the General of the Secretary of the General of the the Secretary of the General of the Secretary of the General of the
ESG fully supports uh, in every means uh, the activities of the chief monitor uh, to ensure the security of the monitors. Uh, for example, the chief monitor has developed a security plan that's uh, developed uh, with a lot of support of the secretariat and that is being implemented right now. But uh, the ESG considers this obligation to be of care very high and it does everything to ensure the safety and security of the monitors in Ukraine. And the question of the honorable delegate of Armenia. Um, yes, the office in Armenia wants to close against one of the host country, against one of the many others. Um, Armenia, we often close the Secretary of Defense, they developed a plan to uh, assistance of the In Armenia, we have developed a plan uh, within four or five weeks after uh, the closure, and I do recall that I'm from the ambassador of Russia and have presented a program early to July last year, and we are still negotiating how far that can be implemented. And we are very much committed to the continuation of the activities. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, uh, among the five questions uh, who were concerning the same issue, that is, as I mentioned at the beginning of my speech, as was uh, shown by the Minister of Foreign Affairs for us, the negotiation over the conflict in Ukraine is the top priority, not just from the the honorable member of the parliament that we requested, but also from our, from our side. Uh, of course, on the issue of uh, Ukraine uh, moving together, the, the, the format that are already existing, the Normandy format, the uh, contact, the bilateral contact format, the USDA, and this observer is part of, not just of the Minsk agreement, but, but also is part of the action. There is a discussion, uh, you know, that some countries want to present some Security Council resolution over the, the participation of the UN uh, uh, envoys, peacekeeper together with the OSCE. There are different positions that you represent the United States, all is working on this issue. So concerning what the UN is going to produce on this side is up to the Security Council. What is necessary for us as OSCE to, to, to know that we have a central role, not just in terms of action, and I repeat again our solidarity to our ambassador there and our uh, observer has to be always clearly mentioned, also in our public opinion. But it's also a question of how to move forward for the political negotiation over the, the final stages of the, um, the, 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 the conflict. So for, for both of you, I think that the, the answer is part of our mandate in terms of OSCE as also the, the, the Secretary General uh, to put forward. Uh, concerning the question on Armenia, I want to say, I say that the protracted conflicts uh, are top priority of our action, not just as a national, let's say, prolonging status diplomatic approach, but is a reality of the fact that we have to, to change the situation. Yeah. Your question is more targeted on sending a more uh, observer. The last meeting in Krakow of, of 18 of uh, January with the ambassador reached an agreement on enlarging the number, I think, you know, around 17 units that are coming more in terms of observers. So it's part also of the co shares group of means, the ambassador, the Polish ambassador, Krasnik and the ministry that uh, were, were there. So this part and this agreement uh, on uh, January is part of answering your question. The most complex question to answer at half past one is the question from our friends from the Georgia. I think that I could challenge all the people that want to go to if I too long. Uh, we, we should be even too long to understand what does it mean populism nowadays, because also the term populism as a, a complex definition and complex nature, uh, not just coming from the political realities of each country, but also coming from the, the, the ideological nature of some party that 
could belong not just in this undistinguished uh, area but with some feet. What is made me more afraid is not just the, let's say, the anti-establishment movement that are creating parties all around Europe. What is creating me more concern is this uh, uh, sovereignistic, uh, nationalistic approach that I think is more dangerous. There is uh, emerging in Europe not just a defending identity or defending border, but there is this uh, tendency to create more uh, closure instead of uh, how we consider the border as a bridge between country identity, building up some uh, constituency like European Union. So, uh, answering to your question, how to, how to react to this tendency is very complex, and I would like not to Thank you very much. Yeah, sorry, Moldova, Transnistria. Uh, uh, to our friends from Moldova, as I mentioned at the beginning, our special employee, foreign ministry, Fatih, is working a lot. And uh, we think that there are some, uh, of course, as for the other contractual conflicts, space for negotiation that are on the table. Uh, I personally also meet with the President of the uh, Republic and uh, Moldova that was in Italy. So our intention, of course, is to have the top priority and so moving up, moving on with the uh, dialogue and cooperation. Thank you. And a brief second round, uh, start with Kalerva, then uh, Mr. Uh, Kishli, and also our representative from Canada, and Romania, and then we'll conclude with that and there might be other questions we can examine. So, sorry about that. Please. Thank you. Thank you, our President. First of all, I want to say that uh, we can congratulate ourselves. The Germany in office is now Italy. It means that we are in the solid hands and the priorities priorities are quite quite really big. I, I am very much appreciate But uh, Mr. President, another thing is that I also welcome very much the reform guidelines by the Secretary General. Uh, and, and I very much also underline the need for the mutual cooperation between the uh, executive structure and the parliamentary assembly in a way, in a voice of the citizens throughout our region. It's very vital, important question in your space, and, and the sound of the contribution of the Secretary General was very, very encouraging. And I'm very pleased of that, so that we have a very good start for the future between the Parliamentary Assembly and, and, and the governmental side. Very good indeed. But, Mr. President, I have also the question to the Secretary General, because uh, every one of us in the OECE, uh, we have the mandate in the hearts, in the minds of the people in our, our region, if we will have any progress concerning the country in and around Ukraine. If not, then the question is a little bit complicated. We know that uh, there is a new idea about peacekeeping mission, peacekeeping operation uh, by Mr. Rasmussen. And of course we realize that it must be mandated by the United Nations Security Council, that's clear. But we are also on board. And, and uh, I'm not so sure if you can answer, but uh, my question goes that, uh, that do we have had any have any 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 contacts with the United Nations Secretary General and the others in there to support this idea to establish the peacekeeping operation uh, in the eastern Ukraine? It would be a very interesting answer to 
here, and, and, and of course we know that we have just very many different forums to, to promote that idea, but uh, it would be very interesting to hear the answer of the Secretary General. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nikishini. Thank you, Mr. President. I want, I want also to thank the Italian Championship for the great job. Actually, during the last short time, we did a great job. We are doing the best of the to raise the image of the OECC to be more involved in the social movements. That's very valuable for us. Mr. Myself, so myself to be here to learn the reforms. Because you know the reforms to achieve the goals, it's important. My question is that, uh, very short, what do you think about it, that, that reforms that we are planning to do at the OECC? Will these reforms impact on the solving of protected conflicts, like in the territory of the some countries like in Azerbaijan? To the side of being more active, will appear in new in, in, uh, will appear in tools that may be like such a Thank you very much. Now, uh, Canada, Francesco Soba. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Canadian delegation, as the chair of Canada, Italy, Parliamentary Day, I would like to commend Italy once again for its unanimous election for the OECD chairmanship for this year. It's really presented an admirable set of priorities for its 2018 chairmanship. Canada particularly welcomes the endeavor to mainstream gender perspectives and all of its OSCE initiatives. I am grateful to the chair of the Indian delegation, Dr. Henry Clark, for her work to highlight gender issues in the migration crisis. Canada also applauds Italy's commitment to seek a solution to the great crisis and to contracted conflicts as well as conflict conflicts. The current stability in these regions will facilitate OSCC or OSCE's progress in all three dimensions of its security policy. Moreover, Canada was pleased to learn that Italy's commitment to address new and ongoing challenges in the Mediterranean, particularly as a way of living into migration. The championship strategy to maximize migrants' economic potential through border security and combat discrimination against migrants will provide a welcome balance. It is also commendable that Italy has committed to a proactive approach on illegal trafficking, especially vulnerable groups such as women and children. I am confident that the gender based analysis will improve the OSC's capacity. The combative crime that has affected so many women and girls. Many of them face dangerous crossings across the country and the risk deaths that can be used. So, the event is very high, and the are also vulnerable to human trafficking. My question is for this afternoon, Mr. is first of all, how will we see the nation uh, more vulnerable to migrant populations, especially women and children, are protected from human trafficking? And secondly, that migrants, once they do arrive to their destination countries, achieve their highest economic potential and contribute to the security of so, uh, so, so countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. And last question for Romania, Duna, Mr. Duna. Thank you, Mr. President. The Boris Office of the Italian Championship of Office. The resolution of the conflict of the Transnistrian region of the Republic of Moldova is a matter of higher priority for the Romans and it's a higher priority. After the breakthrough of Chile, the last fight was the negotiation in November. It is important to understand that progress cannot be achieved without connection to the workers, reliance on simulation, and general conditions for the legitimate authorities' constitution. We expect the Italian chambers in office to be a fair and honorable moderator in the resolution of the conflict in Transnistria. In this context, our question is uh, what are the prospects for organizing the new round of five plus two negotiations talks uh, this year, given the electoral process in Moldova, which will probably increase the political agenda in the second semester of 2018. Thank you very much. Now, last remarks and Updating is always helpful for being more active. So I'm uh, uh, professionally optimistic. So this goes in this direction. Uh, I find very correct the, 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 the question of President Caneva 
because with the UN uh, we have to work a lot. And here I don't want to enter in, uh, in detail, but we organized uh, the trip of our foreign ministry at FANO beginning of March. And in, uh, in New York, 8th of March, we reported the Security Council of UN. And of course, the practical conflict that Ukraine is the main issue where we have to cooperate and work together, not just with European <coughs> member, but with all the Security Council. So I think it's really correct to preserve our action and to find the interaction with all the new representatives, with all the, uh, the state members that are involved in the negotiations. Uh, concerning our, the question from Canada, um, first of all, let me congratulate for your role on the topic of migration and also your G7 presidency is a good hand to, to the global community in terms of project agenda, in terms of also of action of our country towards this global problem. It's so global point that the UN is promoting the global compact on migration that is putting together all the European side, all the African side, creating this global compact that can address the two sides. A refugee uh, escaping from uh, uh, under the international law escaping and then a commission not to be considered refugee, but also the second aspect that in Europe is very well discussed, but it's sometimes controversial, so it's uh, the economical, so-called economical migrants that of course, is a, a distinction that in the European public opinion is well understood, but if you are trying to cross the Mediterranean and escape it from a disaster, it's not so. You cannot ask uh, on the boat if you are legal refugee status so or if you are economical one. So you can imagine that this dimension and the UN is working on this side, the global compact, and your presidency of the G7 is very, uh, is very helpful in this sense because we passed two resolutions in December addressing the human traffickers' uh, uh, fight because over the problem of migration, of course, there are always illegal criminal networks that should be smashed because they are slavers and they are using human beings for money. So there are two resolutions addressing uh, in December. I think we passed the Security Council, there is the second concerning the, 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 the minors the, and the, 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 the child that are involved in the human trafficking. But I think it's one topic that together with the UN should be addressed. Uh, concerning the Transnistria, our friend from Romania, I conclude, as I mentioned, Foreign Ministry, former Foreign Ministry Fartini, 11 and from 11 to 13 of March will be in, uh, uh, will be in there, it's working to have a plus five plus two in April uh, if there are progresses working in this side. So uh, as a presidency, we, we use the foreign ministry like Fratini because we think that uh, we are optimistic because on Transnistria we see some space of action that can combine the two actors in the format that we know between March and April to find an advance in the situation. Thank you very much. Um, I think the Secretary General will be very much welcome to the comments of the Honorable Mr. Premier about the reform and initiative. He will be sure he also uh, really stressed that he sees this as very much as a neutral endeavor. The Secretary General is very much aware of his role, which is primarily to serve the participating states and having said that specifically. Um, he mentioned his speech, for instance, the strategy, strategy supporting, also that he established it in order for him to fulfill his role to a better level to support the chair. His mandate um, tells him to give support to the chair, political support, advice. And this will enable him to do that in a more strategic way. Um, continuing on the question of the honorable delegate from the Bank, his intention is, if there is less by the participating states, to make the organization more fit for purpose. He tries to initiate a process while serving the participating states in uh, making sure. OSCE as an organization can enhance its role to 
to create more dialogue uh, within the region of the 57. I'm a little bit hesitant to comment on the question that you have on the peacekeeping operation, but what I can say is yes, there are more things, but I think that uh, it takes a very humble position, humble role, um, and he relies on the political level, the chair and others, to ensure that the role of OSC is acknowledged and appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, dear guests, uh, dear speakers. Uh, uh, with this, we'd like to conclude the session. We extended the time, but it was extremely interesting to get all your points, very important points, and I'd like to thank all the parliamentarians. Well, shorter the lunch time, but devoted to the important issues that we're discussing here. So, uh, looking forward for cooperation and implementation. Good luck, Italian Chairmanship, Secretary General, Mr. Beckers, thank you. Ambassadors, parliamentarians, and a big applause for everybody in our interpreters. Thank you very much.